The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. It's coming. All these voices. My name is James Hurley. Right back. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Staring Into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr. And with me as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good. How's everybody tonight? On tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about the true history of the real-life Dracula. Now, Dracula is based on a real person. And the guy that it was based on was named Vlad the Impaler. Some historians call him Vlad Tepish. He actually had multiple aliases. He was known as Vlad III, Vlad Dracula, Vlad Tepish, and Vlad the Impaler. Most historians will call him Vlad Tepish, though. Now, Tepish actually means Impaler in Romanian. So, Vlad the Impaler translated into Romanian is simply Vlad Tepish. So, that's where that comes from. Now, he got that nickname because he loved to impale people on stakes. That was kind of his go-to intimidation tactic. And we'll get into the reasons behind that a little bit later on in the show. Vlad was credited with a kill count of between 40,000 and 100,000 people that he impaled. Now, that number is just the people that he had impaled. It doesn't count all the people that he killed in battles or that he ordered the death of in some other way other than impalement. Historians say that the actual number of total kills for Vlad could be triple that when you count every other method of death. So that's potentially 300,000 people that Vlad either personally killed or ordered the death of. Now Dracula is a very iconic name. Pretty much everybody in the world has heard it. Everybody knows who Dracula is. So I want to get into the, the history of the origins of that name. And to do that, we're going to have to go back into the history a little bit. The King of Hungary became the Holy Roman Emperor in 1410. And he founded a secret order of knights that he called the Order of the Dragon. The Order of the Dragon's mission was to defend Christianity and the Empire against the Ottoman Turks. Um, the Turks were trying to conquer all of Christendom. The emblem of the Order of the Dragon was a dragon with fully extended wings and it was hanging on a cross. Now Vlad's father, Vlad II, was admitted to the Order of the Dragon sometime around 1431. And they let him into the Order of the Dragon because he displayed tremendous courage and skill when he was fighting the Turks. From 1431 on, he wore the emblem of the Order of the Dragon while he ruled Wallachia and even put the emblem on his country's coins. 
So you can tell that he was very proud to be a member of the Order of the Dragon. Now that you have a little background information, we're going to go back to the origin of the actual name Dracula. The word for dragon in Romanian is drac, and ul is the definitive article. And in this case, the definitive article would be the. So Vlad's father was called Vlad Dracul, which translated to English would be Vlad the Dragon. So the name Dracul comes directly from his membership in the Order of the Dragon. Now in Romanian, if you want to say the son of, then you add the A on the end of the word. So Dracula would be son of Dracul, or in English, son of the dragon. So Vlad Tepes, the man that inspired the Dracula story, got the name of Dracula because his father served in the order of the dragon. Now the Romanian word drac does not only mean dragon. Um, it can also mean devil in certain contexts. So that's kind of cool because it, it kind of fits either way. Dragon is kind of cool and badass and devil is cool and badass. Either way, it fits uh, Vlad Tepes to a T. Now, in order to properly understand the story of Vlad Tepes, you must first understand what was going on in that area during that time period. When people think of Vlad the Impaler, they think that he was this cruel and sadistic guy. And to a certain extent, that's absolutely true. There is no doubt that he was a sick and evil man, but there are a lot of other factors that were at play here. This is not a story of a power-mad monarch who killed for the sheer joy of it. This is the story of a struggle to try and retain control of your kingdom your region, and ultimately a struggle for the very survival of yourself, your family, and all the innocent people in your kingdom that relied on you to keep them safe. That's what it really boils down to. And failure was simply not an option. Nowadays, if a leader fails, he or she will be voted out of office and live the rest of their lives with the shame of their failure hanging over them. But back in this time, if a leader failed, it meant his or her death, and very likely the death or the enslavement of not only that leader's family, but in many cases, their entire kingdom. So there were a lot of moving parts involved here. Wallachia, which is where Vlad and his father both ruled. Uh, this is in the Balkans, or southern Romania is what it would be today. Uh, Wallachia was right in the middle of two of the most powerful forces in the world at that time. You had Hungary and you had the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Turks. Uh, the Romans were tied in with Hungary as well because it was the Byzantine Empire, which was basically the East Roman Empire. For almost a thousand years, Constantinople was the outpost of the Byzantine Empire, and it blocked the Turks from getting into Europe. A good way to look at this, to make it easier to understand, is Constantinople was the goalie, okay? And they kept the Islamic Ottoman Turks from getting through and ravaging all of Europe. In 1453, Constantinople finally fell to the Turks under Sultan Muhammad the Conqueror. Once Constantinople fell, Hungary, the Roman Empire, and definitely Wallachia, where Vlad ruled, were all at risk of attack from the Turks. And not only were the Turks hellacious fighters and had massive numbers of, of soldiers, but they were driven by a religious fervor that told them that they had to kill anyone that did not agree with their religion. And it was not only their right, but their duty to conquer the entire world and to separate the head from the body of every single infidel. The Hungarian Empire to the north and the west of Wallachia was at its absolute peak at this time, and it took up the mantle of the defender of Christendom. So you had these two giants, the Hungarians and the Turks, that were duking it out, 
and here was little old Valachia stuck smack dab in the middle of their fight, trying desperately not to get wiped out in their war. Think of what a crazy predicament that put them in. They had to somehow forge alliances with both sides without appearing to betray either side. So if the Turks were definitely going to win this battle, then you side with the Turks in that battle. If Hungary had the upper hand at the moment, then you would be on Hungary's side. And you would just go back and forth. It became a truly dangerous and deadly dance, with alliances switching sometimes from battle to battle. Needless to say, Valachia's independence and good fortune did not last very long, because there was absolutely no way that they could keep up this dance for any length of time without eventually having to pay the piper. In most monarchies, the firstborn son takes over the throne when the king dies, and there is a very clear line of succession. But that is not how it worked in Valachia at all. In Valachia, the boyars, who were the wealthy landowning noblemen, they elected the successor from a pool of eligible members of the royal family. So it didn't have to be the firstborn, it could be any member of the royal family that would take over the throne. Now you might think that this was a much better and a much more democratic way to do things because more people had a say in who would rule the country. But what it actually did was cause a lot of violence and a lot of scheming and backbiting. Instead of it being simple and cut and dry because you knew exactly who was next in line, you had various members of the royal family that would be plotting against each other and killing other members of the royal family to eliminate their competition for the throne. That is how Vlad and his father both gained the throne. They basically assassinated anyone who looked like a strong competitor for the throne that they desired. Now, Valachia was founded in 1290 by Rudolf the Black, and it was dominated by Hungary until about 1330-ish, and then it gained a semblance of independence. The first ruler of the new country of Valachia after it gained its independence was Prince Bazarab the Great, and he was actually an ancestor of Dracula, and um, he was actually Vlad's grandfather, I believe. And Prince Mercia the Old reigned from 1386 to 1419. Uh, eventually, the House of Bazarab was split into two different factions. You had Mercia's descendants, and then you had the descendants of a different prince. And his name was Dan something or another. I don't remember exactly what his full name was, but basically this is where the dynasty comes from, this other prince who was named Dan. That's where the dynasty line came from. The majority of the infighting about who was going to be on the throne during this time took place between these two factions. In 1431, Vlad Dracul, which was Dracula's father, was made the military governor of Transylvania. And this was the time period where Dracula was born, when his father was the military governor of Transylvania. It was sometime in the later part of 1431. There are several different dates that historians give for Dracula's actual birthday. Some say 1430, um, some say 1433, and I've even seen some accounts that claim that he was born as late as 1435 or 1436. But the most accepted date is the later part of 1431. Dracula's father wasn't satisfied with simply being the governor. Um, he gathered supporters and he devised a plan to try and seize Valachia from Alexandru I, who was a dynasty prince, and in 1436 he succeeded and killed Alexandru and became Vlad II, the ruler of Valachia. For six years, Vlad Dracul tried to play both sides between his two powerful neighbors so that he wouldn't get squashed by either one. It was difficult because the Prince of Valachia was an official vassal of the King of Hungary. And on top of that, Vlad was still a member of the Order of the Dragon that I talked about earlier on in the show. And he was actually sworn to fight against the Ottoman Turks. 
Now, during this time, the Turks were pretty much like Superman. They were unstoppable. And Vlad was forced to start paying tribute to the Sultan. His father, Mircea the Old, had been paying tribute before that. But Vlad had decided he didn't want to pay tribute because he was a member of the Order of the Dragon and a vassal of Hungary. But it, he just had no choice. He ended up having to do it because they were just too powerful. Now, this is a fairly common practice, uh, paying tribute to the Muslims throughout history. A lot of people don't know that, that our country, the United States of America, were actually paying tribute to the Muslims in the time of our founding. Uh, George Washington did it. John Adams did. Um, finally, Thomas Jefferson had had enough because we had to keep paying larger amounts to these people so that they wouldn't sack our vessels on the oceans and kill our people. And we kept paying more and more money, and they started sacking our vessels and killing our people anyway, even though we were paying them. So Thomas Jefferson got sick of it, and he said, to hell with you guys, and he sent our troops over there and whipped their asses. And after that, they left us alone for quite a while. That's actually where the Marine Corps was started. That's where that part of the Marine Corps hymn comes from, the halls of Montezuma, the shores of Tripoli. Tripoli is where they landed to actually go fight these guys. In 1442, Vlad tried to stay neutral when the Turks invaded Transylvania. Um, the Turks were defeated by the Hungarians when they invaded Transylvania. And the guy that was leading the Hungarians at that time was this dude named John Hunyadi. And he was also known as the White Knight of Hungary. And this is where things began to get a little dicey for good old Vlad. Hunyadi was pissed off because Vlad did not side with Hungary. And remember, Vlad was an official vassal of the King of Hungary, and he was a member of the Order of the Dragon, so he was supposed to side with Hungary in the fight. But he wasn't sure Hungary was going to win, because the Turks were, were awesome, man. They were pretty strong dudes. And he didn't know that if Hungary was going to get beat or if they were going to win, so he was trying to stay neutral. But Hunyadi wasn't having it, and he went after Vlad. So Vlad and his family had to end up fleeing Wallachia and go into hiding. And they stayed in hiding for about a year. And in 1443, Vlad actually regained the Wallachian throne with the support of the Turks. So he kind of swapped his alliances again. And the support of the Turks helped him a great deal, but it came with some major strings attached. The support was on the condition that Vlad would send a yearly contingent of Wallachian boys to join the Sultan's Janissaries. For those that don't know, the Janissaries were like the stormtroopers in Nazi Germany. They were an elite force of soldiers that guarded the Sultan. So Vlad had to send little boys there every year to be specially trained to join this force to maintain the Sultan's support for his rule. In 1444, to prove his loyalty, Vlad actually sent his own two sons, Vlad III, which would end up becoming Dracula later, and his other son, Radu, the Handsome, to serve in the Janissaries. Later in 1444, Hungary broke the peace, and they launched the Varna Campaign, which was led once again by John Hunyadi. And this was an effort to drive the Turks completely out of Europe. Um, Hunyadi demanded that Vlad Dracul fulfill his oath that he took when he joined the Order of the Dragons, and his duty as a vassal of Hungary by joining the crusade against the Turks. Vlad didn't want to side completely with Hungary against the Turks because, one, he wasn't sure exactly how it would all shake out and who would win, and two, now the Turks had his two younger sons, and he didn't want them to be killed in retaliation for him siding with Hungary. So he didn't want that to happen, and the last time he didn't side with Hungary. He got run out of the country and almost killed and lost his throne. And he didn't want that to happen either. So he was in kind of a tough spot. So once again, he tried to thread the needle and find a solution that wouldn't make either side think that he had betrayed them. So what he decided to do was send his older son, Mircea, which was named after his father, to go and fight in his place. And what he was hoping was that the Sultan wouldn't kill his two younger sons because, after all, he hadn't joined the crusade himself. And he was hoping that Hunyadi would be satisfied that he sent his oldest son to fight 
and wouldn't try to run him out of the country again or kill him. The Varna Crusade was a complete and total disaster. The Christian army was completely destroyed in the Battle of Varna. Hunyadi managed to escape the battle, but he did not do it very honorably. He basically tucked tail and ran for his life. From that moment on, Hunyadi was bitterly hostile towards Vlad Dracul and his eldest son, Mircea, because he felt that he wasn't given the level of support that he had asked for, and that was the reason that he ended up being defeated. In 1447, Vlad Dracul was assassinated, and his eldest son, Mircea, was assassinated as well. Now, the way they killed Mircea was terrible. They buried him alive, and it was the boyars and the merchants of Trugervisti that buried him alive. And this made a huge impact on Vlad III, the guy that would later become Dracula. Vlad Dracula got his revenge on the boyars and the merchants in the future. The boyars, the merchants, and all those people that were associated with them were among the people that Dracula impaled later on. After the assassinations of Dracula's father and older brother, Hunyadi placed his own guy, who was a member of the Dynasty clan, on the throne of Wallachia. Now, once the Turks found out that Vlad Dracul was dead, they released Vlad III and supported him as their candidate for the Wallachian throne. A year later in 1448, when Vlad III was 17 years old, he was able to seize the Wallachian throne, but it only lasted for about two months and Hanyadi forced him to surrender the throne again and Vlad had to flee for his life. He ended up running to his cousin, the king of Moldavia, and he hid out there. Vlad's successor instituted a pro-Turkish policy, and this made Hunyadi furious. Hunyadi figured that Vlad was better than the new guy that he had put in, so he sent a message to Vlad to come back out of hiding, and he could have the throne back. As you can see, this was a very unstable time, and things were constantly shifting and changing. Hunyadi forged an alliance with Vlad III to retake the throne of Wallachia by force. In 1453, the Ottomans finally completely conquered Constantinople. They had taken parts of it in the past, but now they had complete and total control of all of Constantinople. At this point in time, Hunyadi broadened his campaign against the Turks. In 1456, Hunyadi invaded Serbia, which was held by the Turks. At the same time that he was invading Serbia, Vlad III invaded Wallachia. Now, they may have attacked at the same time, but they had very, very different outcomes. In the Battle of Belgrade, Hanyadi was killed, and his army was defeated. But Vlad was successful and was able to retake the throne of Wallachia, and he ruled from that point for quite a long, long time. Now, that was the basic history of what was going on at the time and how he got into power. Now that you have a basic understanding of the history, we will talk about all the good stuff, the atrocities that he was known for and the reason that he was called Vlad the Impaler. If there was one thing that Vlad was known for, it was his inhuman cruelty. His preferred method of torture and of execution was impalement. Now, this was one of the most gruesome and painful ways that you could ever die. A lot of people think that, okay, you get stuck on a stake and that sucks, but at least it's quick because you have this massive stake that goes all the way through you. But sadly, this simply was not the case. Um, impalement was actually a very slow and extremely painful death. Now, the way they did it was ingenious, but horrifying at the same time. Now, what they would do is they would attach a horse with ropes tied to the horse to each of the victim's legs, and they had a stake that was gradually forced up into the body. Uh, they would oil the end of the stake to make it nice and slick and lubed up, and they would also make sure that the end of the stake wasn't sharp. They wanted it dull so that it would not puncture any of the organs as it made it way through the body. So basically what would happen is it would 
push the organs to the side. So what they would basically do, and this is going to be a little bit graphic. I'm not going to get too nasty with it. I'm going to be, I'm going to use clinical terms, but it's going to be a, a realistic depiction of the violence. So just a warning before I start. They would insert the dull tip of the stake into the rectum, and they would start walking the horses forward one step at a time. Now, remember, the horses have ropes tied to them that are tied to the legs of the person being impaled. So what would happen is the stake would very slowly push its way up through the body. Now, because the stake was not sharp and because it was moving very, very slow, it would actually push the organs out of the way as it went up through you. So it would do a little superficial damage, but nowhere near enough to really kill you. They would continue this process until the stake eventually exited your body through your mouth. Then they would anchor the stake into a hole and they would leave you there like that with the stake coming out of both ends of your body. So it would be going in your bottom, coming out your, your mouth. Now sometimes it would take days to die from this. Your body didn't really go through much shock because it was done very slowly and none of your organs were damaged in the process. So a lot of the people that died from impalement actually died from dehydration, if you can believe that. So they, they would just kind of be stuck there with this stake going through them, this giant pole basically, and they would die of thirst instead of dying of shock or bleeding or, you know, trauma from, from the wood going through them. Now Vlad would also get very creative with the placement of the stakes as well. Uh, he would do all kinds of different geometric patterns. The most common pattern that he would use was he would make several rings of impaled people. And it would basically be in the shape of a target, like a bullseye target. And he would like to do that in front of cities that he was trying to conquer. And this was supposed to send the message that the city was the next target of his. Um, also, the height of the stake that he used would indicate the rank of the victim. So the higher the rank of the person being impaled, the larger pole the person would be on. And he would also leave the corpses up on the stakes for months after they had already died until they were literally falling apart. Um, this was done as a warning and also to scare the living hell out of people. Because remember, you have the Ottoman Turks that are constantly invading places and killing everybody. And on the other side of Wallachia, you have the Hungarians. And they keep attacking too and making people do what they want. And you also have the Romans that are still hanging around and kind of siding with the Hungarians. And it, everybody knows that the Romans like to smack people around all the time. So there were a lot of different forces that really did not play well with others in the neighborhood. And they were looking for signs of weakness and an easy mark. So you needed a strong deterrent. You needed something to keep all these different forces from invading your country and killing you. There's this one famous story where there was this Turkish army that came up and they were going to attack. And they came across thousands of rotting corpses that were impaled on the banks of the Danube River. And they just turned around and left. Basically, they said, the hell with this, we're out of here. You know, this guy's crazy. And they just bailed. Um, in 1461, Muhammad II, who was the guy that eventually ended up conquering Constantinople, and this is a guy that was not known to be squeamish or weak at all. But he actually had to turn around and go back to Constantinople because he got physically ill after he saw 20,000 Turkish prisoners that had been impaled outside of a city. Um, that was the one that they called the Forest of the Impaled. Some of you have probably heard that before. Um, so basically, Vlad ruled through fear and he ruled through violence. Uh, he had some success fending off the Turks, but in 1462, he was forced to flee to Transylvania. His first wife committed suicide by jumping off the castle. Now, this is what you saw in Bram Stoker's Dracula that forced Vlad to make a deal with the devil in the movie. And the reason that she killed herself in real life, though, is because the Turks were getting ready to take the castle and she did not want to be captured by the Turks because she would have been repeatedly raped and tortured to death. Rather than go through that nightmare, she threw herself off the top of the castle. Vlad escaped through a secret passage, 
and he fled across the mountains into Transylvania. Now, he went to Transylvania trying to get help. But instead of helping Vlad, the king had him arrested and thrown into the prison inside the royal tower. Now, there's some debate as to how long he was imprisoned. The Russians say that he was a prisoner from 1462 until 1474. But during this time, he won his way back into the good graces of King Crevinus and ended up marrying a member of the royal family. It might have been the king's sister. We're not entirely sure. But we do know that he had two more children with his new wife. Now, when the oldest son that he had with his new wife was about 10, Vlad was able to regain the Valachian throne once again. Um, it ended up not going too well for Vlad in the end. He was killed in a battle with the Turks near Bucharest in December of 1476. Some reports claim that he was assassinated by the boyars just as he was about to win the battle. And other accounts claim that he was killed by the Turks on the battlefield. History doesn't know for sure whether it was an inside job and he was taken out by the boyars in the battle or whether he fell to the Turks while he was fighting. There's even a report that he had won the battle, and right at the end of it, one of his own soldiers accidentally killed him. We don't know exactly how he died, but what we do know is that his body was decapitated by the Turks, and they sent the decapitated head to Constantinople, and the Sultan displayed his head on a stake as proof that the horrible Vlad the Impaler was finally dead. In the ultimate example of irony or poetic justice, depending on your viewpoint, the man that had impaled over 100,000 people ended up with his head on a stake at the end of his life. And now you know the actual history of the real life Dracula. I'm gonna throw over to old boy now to get his take on Dracula and some other information. Yeah, we'll get into the whole uh, uh, movie bit in a second because we don't we only have about twenty minutes. But just to let you know, actually, they don't really know when he died. There's an argument he didn't die to seventeen. I mean, uh, fourteen seventy seven. So uh, there's also uh, like he was saying about when he was born. Actually, it was twenty eight to thirty one. There's a three year difference. They don't know when he was born, but. There's an argument about when he died. They said he might have died a year later, and he really what he didn't get killed, or he just was murdered after. And they and there's different stories, but it's what basically Hershey's got him on the uh, on there. Basically, the whole movie came along when Bram Stoker. You know, everybody knows about the Dracula book, and at 1897 he wrote it. And I think it's because he went to Romania before that, or like a year or two before that. And heard the story, so he just made it into that fictional story with you know with Dracula, what we know in today is. And then the you know Hollywood, Hollywood in nineteen thirty one made Bella Lugosi as Dracula, and even before that they made Nosferatu. I think that was in nineteen seventeen or something like that. But they were both based off of that story, you know, Dra uh, Vlad the Impaler, uh, Dracul, the Dragon, the Devil. So he wrote the book. I guess it got real popular. And then, you know, from there, Hollywood did their work of making it a sex object. Like everybody knows Dracula now. He's a sex object, a killer. You've seen the new the re, the movie in the 90s with uh, Keanu Reeves. And um, God, I, who's the guy that played the movie with? Oldman, Oldman Gary Oldman. And um, Ryan, Renata Weider, writer and... He basically said she killed herself, but see in the movie, she kills herself because they the Turks say they killed him and sent her a letter. So she jumped off and killed herself on the bridge. So he gets pissed off, betrays God, and turns into this. That was why he turned into a vampire, made a deal with the devil, and that turned. And actually, they're saying it was a curse by God for turning his back on God. And then if you ever seen Dracula Untold, it says he meets some vampire in some um, uh, cave or something, and he, the vampire gives him the power. But that that's the whole, you know, lore on the, you know, the movie. 
Vlad the Impaler was a very, really disgusting person. I mean, he was it to their people. He they loved him, but if you didn't agree with him, he killed his own people. He um one time, I guess the villagers, some people pissed him off, and. I guess he had three different reigns, and it was one of his, I think, his second reign after he came back. So he threw a big festival and had all these people come in, and his soldiers shut them all in, and he killed them all. And there's rumors that Vlad was also into cannibalism, and he drank blood, and he used to dip blood, his bread into blood, and these big old bowls of his victims, and he would eat hands and all kinds of stuff. He was a pretty, pretty wicked person. And like he said, he would put it up there, the, the, he, they would lube up the, the pole and impel you. And that's not a very comfortable way to die. I wouldn't want to die that way. And he did that because he wanted to make his enemies, the Turks at that time or anybody, fear him. Because he would kill so many people that way, they didn't want to end up like that. It was more for fear. And you don't mess with this guy. And Vlad did some really, really nasty things to get into this. Like, um, he had a mistress that he disemboweled when she was pregnant. What else did he do? He would boil people in, in like some oil or something. I read, I was reading about this. He also would cut people's hands off and eat it in front of people. And that, that's a rumor, though. On that whole, that's where they got the whole vampire thing where he drinks blood because they said that was one of his things he would do is he would start drinking blood. He got bloodthirsty. Basically, he went crazy. That's why they killed him in such a messed up way because, and they stuck his head on a, and a, on, and, and impaled because he did that to so many people. He was just a nasty ruler, ruler, but the people loved him because he was protecting them. But after a while, you know, people go back and forth. Like he was saying, they go flip-flop. When whoever's winning, that's what always happens through, you know, how the world goes. Whoever's winning the war, everybody jumps ship. So he'd go back and forth and, you know, basically till he got killed. But there's an argument because they're saying it's 17, I mean, 1476. But they're saying he did, might have not even died to the 77, a year later from old age. So there's an argument about what really happened to him. And now if you go to his castle that it still exists in Transylvania, that it's still haunted from all the people that were murdered and killed there and all over that area. It's one of the most haunted areas because so many people died with the Turks and the Romanians and tra in, in Transylvania and all over that area. And people go to that. I've seen it on TV. They go do that ghost hunting stuff and, they go looking for ghosts. There's people who've gone there and said it's like the one of the most haunted places they've ever been. I've seen videos on it because there's so many bad things that's happened. And they say when bad things happen, it just stains there like a blood stain or like, like, uh, it's just, it, it's like a fingerprint. It just stays there because they, 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 all these back then people did crazy things to people when they wanted to prove a point, they disemboweled you. They stretched your four limbs with a uh, horse on each side. He got pour, pulled apart. There was, um, you know, impelling. They got their blood drinking in front of pe other people. They would rape uh, their women or men or whatever. It didn't really matter in front of their kids to prove a point of fear. They would disembowel pregnant women with their babies and burn them. Just... There's just some few things that I was, you know, I'm being very graphic, you know, but you know how I am. I'm different than James. Like he gives people a warning. I'm, <laughs> I, it just, the whole story has always been awesome, but the know he's real and what he did. And I know why he did it because he had to, because the Turks were no nice people. They come and take over just like her. She said that, uh, and what they would do. And, and this has always happened and, and, and tradition with you know with Muslims and um, anybody in the Middle East, if they would take a country over, like you saw three hundred, that's why that all started because they wanted his kids and and the Romans' kids so they could be trained for soldiers. They are just basically going to be taught for soldiers or whatever the 
the the Turks or whoever wanted them at those times, you know, the Sultan wanted. So basically, that's what they would do. And that was would keep them from getting destroyed if they gave you these bargains with them. So that's why Vlad had to go with his brother to the Sultan. And then he learned how to be a pretty much a learned how to be a, a, a general soldier, basically. That era was very brutal anyway. It was just a nasty way, way to live. I'm glad I don't live in these these times and dates. I'm glad, you know, kind of like I thought about it. I'm kind of glad it, I don't live in these kind of days and eras because it would have been pretty crazy. So, you know, I mean, I don't know if I could do some of the stuff that people did, but I guess back then it was acceptable. I wouldn't say it was right, but I guess if you wanted the enemy to be scared, you're going to do stuff like that. And yeah, he did some brutal things and I just, I think it's awesome, but not the way he did people, but I just think the story and Dracula story and the order of dragons supposedly still exist to this day. And that's a whole nother story. We'll get down to I'm going to look into that and see if we can actually do about the order of the dragon. That's a very interesting story. Also another little interesting side note that I wanted to talk about real quick in the middle ages and throughout history, when people wanted to kill a vampire, they would cut the vampire's head off and they would drive a stake through the vampire's heart. Now, the majority of the times when this happened, it was done to a corpse inside of a coffin because you would have some sort of illness going around that was making a lot of people sick that they couldn't figure out what was going on. Or you would have crop failures or just a a general run of very, very bad luck. And they would attribute that to one of a couple different causes. Either they would think that it was witchcraft, or they would believe that there was a vampire loose that was causing these things to happen. So what they would do is anybody that was recently dead, they would dig them back up to check and see if this person was a vampire. Now, a couple of the ways that they would tell that this person was actually dead or was undead vampire was if you were a vampire, your fingernails would continue to grow after death, your hair would continue to grow, and a lot of times you would have blood on your mouth. To these people, that was a sign that you had not in fact died, but instead you were still alive in a sense. You were undead and you were getting out of your grave at night and terrorizing the community. The problem is scientifically we know that the hair and the fingernails continue to grow. Sometimes for weeks after death. So you're going to have longer fingernails and longer hair when you're dug back up than you had when you died because it continues to grow. Now, it doesn't continue to grow forever, but for a short period of time, it does. So you will have a noticeable difference. We also know that in the process of decomposition, you have a lot of breakdown happening inside the body. There are a lot of gases that are released that cause bloating. That can make the body look like it has a full stomach, even though it doesn't. It's just gas. Also, what this gas does is it pushes liquids out of the body through the different orifices. You will have a leaking of a, a reddish brown fluid that will go out of your rectum and it will come out of your ears sometimes, out of your nose and out of your mouth. So when they would open up the coffin and they would see the mouth with what appeared to be blood on it, they would assume that here they had a vampire that was out drinking blood. When in fact what it was was the internal mechanisms of the body breaking down and forcing those liquids up through the holes, basically. Now, what I wonder here, is there a correlation between that, the idea of, of digging up a corpse to behead it and drive a stake to its heart, is there a correlation between that and the way Vlad died? We know that that was common practice after the death of Vlad the Impaler, and we also know that that was common practice before the death of Vlad the Impaler. 
So when they killed Vlad the Impaler, did they behead him as a way to ensure that he was dead because they believed him to be a vampire? Because in some of the papers of that time, there is talk that he might have been a vampire. So we know that that idea was floating around back then. That this man is so evil, so terrible, that he must be some sort of demon or some sort of vampire kind of creature. So we know that that was a thought. So was the cutting off of Vlad's head a way to deal with, with a supposed vampire the way that lore tells you to deal with a vampire? We don't know what they did with the body. It was buried, I know that much. But I don't know if they, if they rammed a stake through the heart when they put it in the coffin. They very well might have. History doesn't record whether that happened or not. I guess you would assume from that that maybe it did not happen because they're not going to say we just buried Vlad the Impaler at this crypt in this area and we did not ram a stake through his heart. You're only really going to mention it if you do and if it's important. But it might be one of those things that's lost to history. I don't know. But we do know that they cut his head off and delivered it to the Sultan in Constantinople. We know the Turks did this. It's undeniable fact. We also know that the Sultan had Vlad's head stuck onto a stake and displayed for everybody to see as undeniable proof that the monster Vlad the Impaler was finally gone. We killed him. We beat him. He can't hurt you no more. And also, I guess, as a way of bragging, too, let's be honest. Like, hey, we won. We kicked this guy's ass. We're the champions. He's nothing. We know that also happened. Undeniable fact. You will have, you know, these little conspiracy theories of people saying, yeah, yeah he didn't die till then. He didn't die till there. But we know what the documentation says. We know what the majority of historians agree on. Is it 100% fact? Who can say? It happened a long time ago. All we can go by is the documentation and the records that are available. So 100% you don't ever know what actually happened. But you have a pretty good idea based on writings of the time and reports of the time of what happened. So we know that they cut Vlad's head off. We know that they displayed that head for everybody to see. So my question is, was that a way of dealing with a supposed vampire? I think it's possible. Is it probable? I don't know. We know that they thought he might have been a vampire, so it could have been one of those combination, let's cut his head off and impale it on a stake. That'll, that'll learn him, because he's been impaling everybody all this time. That's a good way to kill him. That's a good way to, to mock him in death and belittle his, his image of fear. Is, hi, you're not so tough. Look, now your head's on a stake. I'm sure that there was some of that. But maybe it was also a case of, hey, just in case. You know, maybe the Sultan was like, I'm not saying he's a vampire, but just in case, let's stick this puppy's head on a stake and, you know, cut it off, be safe. Just in case. Because no matter what kind of creature you are, beheading will definitely slow you down. You know, there's a lot of different ways to kill a lot of these things. Some is iron, some is silver, some is beheading. Some you have to burn. Uh, beheading works on just about everything. It may not kill everything, but I guarantee you, if it doesn't have a head, it's not going to be trying to eat you. And if it does, it's not going to be very successful. Because you can't operate very well without your head. So beheading is always a good bet when you don't know how to kill a creature. If it's after you, just cut the sucker's head off. And you, you got a pretty good shot of not dying. So I'm sure that... It could have been that as well. It could have been a, hey, just in case, man, let's cut this guy's head off. I will let you guys make your own decision on that. I will leave it up to you to decide if that's a plausible theory. If you think that there might have been a little bit of that involved, of people saying, hey, he's a vampire. we got to do this to kill him. And it could have been some of the cases after his death of that happening to people they dug up of cutting their head off and ramming a stake to their heart, it could have been that that was partially because of the way Vlad died and partially because that's the way the lore always said to do it. To me, it was just extremely interesting. It's a nice little side road to go down on this, on this little adventure we're on here because 
I like that cause and effect. I like to find those answers. I like to know, okay, they did this thing, but why did they do this thing? Because on the face of it, that seems kind of insane. Why would you do that? There has to be a reason. And what I'm presenting to you here is a possible reason. Now, is it is it true? I don't know. I mean, I'm always 100% with you guys, man. I'm honest. I don't know. But it seems like it could be. And it would be really cool if it was, right? So that's something for you guys to chew on. Uh, let me know down in the comments what you think. Thank you, brother. I want to thank everybody for listening to the show. Uh, Vlad the Impaler is an awesome story. One of my favorites. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you to everybody on Para-X Radio and 28 different countries. I'm, I'm, I'm excited every week to do this show. I love it. Please check me out again. I'm going to do that part two of that podcast uh, with uh, with Chris Edge. Check it out. It'll be up again on YouTube in about a week or less so you guys can hear the second part of Old Boy. Um, I love you guys. I appreciate it. Remember, if you guys want to listen to our newer or older shows, go on James Hershey's YouTube and hit... Uh, put it in the box, James Hershey Jr., and you'll see the bald dude with the beard, <laughs> big bald white guy, and subscribe, and you can listen to all our old shows and newer shows. Or you can listen to us every week on Sunday night, 12 Eastern, on Parallax. But I love you guys. Thank you. I love all my fans. I appreciate you guys. Remember to check out our store. You can buy a lot of merch there, so check it out. Nice shirts of all, a couple of our shows are, are even James's books, uh, pictures of, uh, with James Hershey and, and me with uh, separate, or you can just get the show. There's three or four different different shirts, sweaters, baby clothes, all kinds of stuff. Just check it out, and he'll tell you in a minute where to go. Other than that, I love you guys. I want to say I love my daughter, my girlfriend, and everybody else. I love you. Blessed be. Have a great night. Night, Sugar Ladies, Misfits, and Demon Hunters, I love you. The link to the YouTube channel is youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. The link to the merchandise store, if you're looking for merch, is teespring.com slash store slash staring into the abyss. On that website, like old boy said, there are t-shirts, there are hoodies, sweatshirts, pretty much everything. They have like leggings for, for women. You can even get a poster or a towel or, or whatever you want. There's all kinds of cool stuff there. Uh, the prices are really good and the quality is really good. So if you're in the market for merch, then there you go. There's the site. It's teespring.com, T-E-E. S-P-R-I-N-G.com slash store slash staring into the abyss. I make my living, as you all know, as a horror author. So I'd like to do a little self-promotion on this episode and ask you all to check out my novels. Uh, you can find them on Amazon. You can find them on Walmart, Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, all those sites. I wrote the I Am Legion series. That's I Am Legion, The Rise of the Revenant, and the surrogate of souls and i also have a novel named called the wind spirits they are all on prime so if you want to order the paperback probably the best way to go is amazon prime because it'll be there in two days uh, they're also available on kindle uh, i have audiobooks all that give them a read and see what you think and let me know leave a review or whatever and thanks a lot i really appreciate all the support and all the love that we get from you guys it really means a lot and it's kind of a cool thing because you never know what's going to happen when you, when you bring up your Facebook or your Twitter or Instagram or something like that. I'm like anybody else in the world. When, when I pull up my social media, I check my notifications to see, you know, what's going on. And it's always neat when you have a message or something like that or a comment from somebody that ordinarily in, in normal life you would never have the opportunity to speak to this person you know like i have people that are huge fans of, of my novels and huge fans of the show from all parts of the world which is really neat to be able to talk to somebody from from japan or, or china or russia or or wherever england and it, it's, it's neat because it gives you a different 
kind of perspective on things. You know, like with this show on Vlad the Impaler, we're talking about Romania, we're talking about Transylvania, we're talking about Hungary, we're talking about that area of the world. So it's going to be interesting for the fans who listen to the show in those countries to actually be able to comment and message and let us know how we did. You know, how bad did I butcher the pronunciation on some of the Romanian words? Because I don't speak Romanian. It's not my first language. You know, I know a little, but I don't know enough to to be 100% confident that I nailed every syllable. So those kind of things are kind of cool when you can get that feedback from people that live in the actual area you're speaking of. It's just one of the beautiful things about social media and the beautiful things about the Internet is that ability to connect with people all over the world. Very, very cool. But thank you guys so much for all your support. Once again, thank you for all your love. We appreciate you more than you will ever know. You guys mean a hell of a lot to us, and I, I want you to know that from the bottom of my heart. Until I speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you, and so do we. Bye-bye.